The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. In the course of his preaching, John the Baptist said, Someone is following me, someone who is more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It was at this time that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. No sooner had he come up out of the water than he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit, like a dove, descending on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. My favour rests on you. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the ways that which uh, Hebrew um, narrative works is that, that it uses key words in one passage or key themes and then repeats something um, from a bit earlier and then it makes the link. So when you hear one word that's a special word and you think, oh right, that, that, we, that was used earlier on there, or this idea, like the ascendancy of a younger son or something like that, that relates to there as well. And so there becomes a pattern in the text which helps us to understand this text here because it relates to that text. So this text over here says, helps us to understand this text. And that's exactly what's happening in this passage here. Except that this is the New Testament referring back to the Old Testament. And it's a short passage, but it's got some really important words that help us to understand what's going on. What St. Mark here is trying to tell us about Jesus. The whole focus, of course, of Mark's Gospel is right on the person of Jesus. Who is this man who is truly God and truly man? So what we've got here is some key words which relate to Exodus and to Genesis. Now, you've heard of a schism, haven't you? A split between people and a schism in the church um, over a thousand years ago when we had the East and West, the Orthodox and the, and the Catholics. Well, that word is a Greek word, schism. It means splitting apart. A complete splitting apart. And so we've got that word, actually, in Exodus, in, in chapter 14. It doesn't occur very much in the Greek version of the Old Testament, which call it the, uh, the Septuagint. It occurs about 11 times. And one of these times is in Exodus 14. Now, I know you all remember what, that, about what happened then, which was Moses leading the Hebrew slaves from slavery under Pharaoh through the wilderness. But to get to the wilderness, they crossed through the Red Sea. And God had a really strong easterly wind blowing all night. And it split, the same word here, schism, split the water apart. So the Hebrew ex-slaves could walk through uh, on dry ground and get to the desert where they wandered for 40 years. So there we've got the splitting apart. And we've also got another word as well, which was the water. So Jesus was baptised in water. That's hudor, like hydroelectric power, hydrofoil and so on. So hudor, the water split um, that was in, in Exodus, sorry, the water splitting. And Jesus came out of the water, and for him, the heavens were split open. So we're reminded of Exodus chapter 14, the setting free of the Hebrew slaves. So who is this Jesus? He is the new Moses who's going to set people free from the slavery, not to the Egyptians, but to slavery to sin. Then we've got another use of schizo, splitting apart. Remember, there are hardly any uses in the Old Testament. But this is chap Genesis chapter 22, which is the sacrifice of Isaac. When God called Abraham uh, to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Now remember, Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children. They were getting on in years. Uh, no children. But God had made a promise to Abraham that he was going to be the father of a great nation. It's a bit difficult to do if you haven't got any children. But in the end, they did have a son, Isaac. And what did God do, uh, do 
having given birth to the son Isaac when he was a, a lad, a young, young boy, perhaps a teenager, God said, I want you to sacrifice your only son whom you love on Mount Moriah. Now, your only son whom you love is supposed to ring a bell because we heard the same words in that passage of scripture. Do you remember what it was when Jesus came out of the water and he said, he heard the voice saying to him, to Jesus, you are my beloved son. You're my beloved son um, in whom I'm well pleased. So there rings a bell. It's not an exact thing, but quite often you find this quote in the Old Testament. There's a slight variation. So you are my, my beloved son. Abraham was asked to sacrifice his beloved son. But it doesn't just stop there as well, actually, because it gets more exciting than that. Because on the way to Mount Moriah, they're carrying the wood. Or the wood for the burnt offering, because they were going to go up the mountain, light the fire, and as they would do with, a, with an animal, you, you slaughtered the animal, put it on the fire, and offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, he didn't just take wood. He, take, he had taken wood that had been split. And that's the only use of that word in Genesis is the word schizo, so it's, it's a participle actually. Um, so it's wood having been split, using the same word, very important word. So here he is taking the wood's been split to go up the mountain and he's the beloved son. So again, Mark here is drawing us back, in this case, to Genesis chapter 22. The wood that's been split and the beloved son. So he's saying, if you want to understand what's going on here in the baptism of Jesus, you also need to understand Genesis chapter 22, the sacrifice of, um, of Isaac. Now, as we know, because we know our Bible very well, being good Catholics, um, in chapter 22, in the end, Moses didn't have to sacrifice his son because the angel of the Lord stayed his hand and he said, there is the lamb. There was a ram caught in the thicket. You don't need to slay your son, but you offer this lamb as a sacrifice in his stead. Now, next week, um, just a little preview if you like, uh, next week we've got John uh, chap um, chapter 1, which is just after the baptism of Jesus, um, when John the Baptist points out Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away this into the world. So it's worth just remembering that, because that also relates back to the Lamb who was caught in the thicket, who is Jesus prefiguring Jesus. So Jesus is going to be this new lamb. So both these passages, Exodus 14, um, the passing through the Red Sea, being set free from the slavery to the Pharaoh, and chapter 22 of Genesis, which is the sacrifice of Isaac, both tell us different parts, different sides, if you like, of the person of Jesus, the character of Jesus. There's one last little thing that's referred to here, which is the dove. And the dove came out of heaven as the, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove on Jesus. Now I expect you can think, now where was a dove in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll answer it. It was Noah, right? Noah's ark. So because of the sinful people, God decided to destroy everybody except the eight people who are going to be saved in the ark. And when the waters had abated, uh, the, there was the dove bringing back the, the branch of a twig of olive. To, as a sign that the waters were abating. So it was the sign of the end. But the most important thing about this was the rainbow in the sky and the presence of the dove, which was a new covenant. So it's a new pact that God had made with his people. I will be your God and you shall be my people and you shall obey my commandments and I shall be your God and protect you. And I shall remember this. Remembering it means bringing it back to life all the time. Uh, giving us the fruits of that covenant. So that's what's happening here as well, is we've got this new covenant that is happening through the baptism of Jesus, or it's at the beginning, if you like, the inauguration of the new covenant, the new agreement with God and man, that now he's made the definitive sacrifice, which we know because we know the story, Jesus will die in the end. Um, all this leading up to in Mark's Gospel, leading up to Jesus' death on the cross, because dying for us, he's establishing a new covenant. The new covenant that takes away our sins, fulfilling the uh, uh, Exodus 14, and making us sharers in that very life of Jesus, which means we too can be called the beloved son. Sometimes we get stuck for praying, don't we? 
and it's quite hard because we think, gosh, what do I say now? And I'm really drying up. Well, there are lots of little bits and perhaps we can use bits of scripture. And there's one little bit here that I recommend, which says, you are my son, the beloved, my favour rests on you. And perhaps when we're stuck, when we're praying, then we can just read those passage, that, that, that phrase through. You are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and my favour rests on you. That is God speaking to each one of us when we pray that he wants to see us as he sees his own son. Yes, we have to obey his commandments and everything. He's saying that to us. You are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and my favour rests on you. That's how much God thinks of us.